I'm no stranger to, um, you know, getting owned. This week on Backward Compatible. Jim and Doc reflect on 2015's highs and lows in gaming, then name their personal games of the year. Plus, Doc shares his impressions of Star Wars Battlefront, and Jim talks about The Witcher 3. The Backward Compatible .com podcast starts right now. Welcome, Backward Compatible listeners. We're here with the year in review. Year in review? Year end review? One or the other. The, um, the year in review. The year in review, yes. yes. And this is, this is going to be a less formal episode because Chris is not here to keep us in line, so watch out. Of course, I'm Jim, and I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And uh, we're going to uh, review, talk about the year, our year in gaming, games that we really like this year. We'll probably go off on some tangents talking about games that maybe we like certain aspects of them a lot. Didn't like other parts of the game. I'm sure there's plenty that we can talk about there. By this year, we mean last year. Oh yes, uh, I should I should because preface that. Yeah, that's 2015, which we're no longer in. We are in 2016, and we're going to be talking about 2015. Yeah. So happy New Year, everybody, because here we are. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right. So the first game that I want to talk about is a game that I got for Christmas. Uh, since we took our little break, I haven't had a chance to talk about it, and that's Battlefront. Oh, how is that? Um, it is both brilliant and amazing and absolutely disappointing at the same time. <laughs> so you start us off with the game that, just like I was talking about, yeah, some great exactly. things and bad things. I did that as a transition. See, that's what, oh. that's what it was. No, brilliant. No, brilliant. Not Cut this part. Cut this yeah. part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start with the, the part that I like very much. Mm. It's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it lives up to every... Um, breathtaking moment that was implied that we would have in all the trailers. Is this, um, is this PS4? That you're yeah, I, I'm playing it on PS4. Okay. okay. And you get everything that you would expect from a Battlefront game. You run around in first person or third person, as is your preference, over the shoulder. Hmm. And you have guns and you shoot people and you die a lot. Um, a, a lot. And this is the problem that I have with it. Uh, I'm no stranger to, um, you know getting owned in fact maybe we should just go ahead and call this hashtag get wrecked uh <laughs> slash uh, it's a crossover because it's it gets a crossover <laughs> segment because the the truth is um you know whenever you play these games you got to expect there, there's a noob factor mm -hmm. the problem that i have is this whenever you design in the noob factor there's a problem and this can go for any pvp game let me explain uh no there is too much let me sum up Basically, it comes down to this. You either have player ability or you have character ability. And sometimes you have both. This is a game that requires both. But essentially what it means is that until you level up your character by playing lots of games and by dying lots of times and by getting in-game currency and then purchasing better gear, better guns, and then there's some um, vanity stuff too, you're going to die. Because, oh really? Yes. It's, so it's one of those that sets it up so that uh, I've played some some FPSs like that too, and those really frustrate me. Yeah, and so uh, you could have been playing this for well, let's say you've been playing it since it came out, mm -hmm. or let's say I've been playing it since it came out. There we go. Uh, so I've been playing it since it came out. Uh, I have a character who's um, oh level thirty or something. I don't, by the way, but um, we'll pretend. And you and I decide that we're going to go head-to-head -head in, in this thing. Real quick, is 30 the max level? No, I have no idea. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but the problem is, if I shoot my gun at you, I will kill you. I will one-shot you every single time, as long as I hit. Because I have bought this what? really really great weapon. And, and there's, you know, there's certain weapons Ugh. that are like, oh, this is the shotgun. If you, sh if you hit me anywhere. Well, pretty much, yeah. Because I've got, I've got weapons that are so powered up, and I've got 
um, jump packs and I've got abilities and I've got and, and I like the way that the loadout is done. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, you've got three cards; they're mapped to the buttons. Um, you know, there's really great stuff that you can do. Now, that, in, yeah, that that sounds frustrating. <laughs> in in defi- and it's terribly frustrating. Yeah. Um, and so some would look at this as an opportunity or motivation, if you will, to um, to play more. Oh, I want to be I want to be better. I want to be like that guy. Um, for, um, for those that can't see, I'm, I'm, I raised an eyebrow and shook my head. Yes, you did. It was, <laughs> it was very sarcastic and noble. Yeah. Um, the, the problem that I have with it is this. I was raised on, on Quake and Doom. Yeah. Oh, not, yeah. Not, oh, yeah. Not, in, not in that order. Hell, yeah. Um, in fact, you know, I, I never even liked Halo because... Oh, no, I didn't either. It was too Same slow. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean that literally. I mean, it was... You walk around, I'm like, where's the run button? There isn't one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's like... I want the game to be fast paced. I want to jump pads. I want to move around. I want a rail gun. Um, you know, in, insta insta rail unlag. You know, <laughs> this is where the you want to be able to kill someone with a pistol if he has a great weapon. Because yeah. as long as you're good and you catch him at the right moment, maybe he can kill you one shot because he has like a like That's a right. top weapon. But you can kill him too. That's exactly and, right. And it sounds to me like in Battlefront that doesn't that isn't the case. Right. That's exactly right. Um, like like Counter Strike is a great example. It had loadouts. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you extensively played Counter Strike. I much, did, but it's I was a good huge example. into it. And um, it's one of those games where you know it's all it's it's a very skill heavy game. And yes, mm-hmm. one of the main skills, um, and so something that some people might did complain about was if you knew the level very well, like the stage that you're in, right? You knew all the hiding spots, yeah. and so it gave you a huge advantage. Well, that's true. So too. it wasn't just skill with the guns. That being said, um, that's you know knowledge and skill going hand in hand kind of thing for planning out strategy, but when it comes to the loadouts, if you don't have a lot of money uh, and you can't buy, like, you know, the AK-47 right. or any of these any of these better weapons or, like, a sniper rifle or something, mm-hmm. you have to have a pistol, you can still win with that pistol. It doesn't right. matter. That's I mean, exactly you right. have an easier time if you have one of the other weapons. You can totally... It's totally viable. Yep. And I, there's a balance there that it sounds like Battlefront didn't really balance very well, and, didn't figure out. And so, uh, you know, some might argue and say well you know what that's that's obviously not the game for you that's the way it was designed you should just step away slowly i would come back with this bioshock 2 Mm. bioshock 2 was one of the very first with a loadout um, in pvp um bioshock 2 had a pvp a lot of people didn't even realize you're blowing my mind that it even had a pvp it had a pvp i played and actually really enjoyed bioshock 2 and i didn't even know it didn't notice it had a pvp (laughs) it did um and and it was a really well done pvp Mm. and you played not as the the big daddy kind of a thing but actually as one of the splicers whenever you're designing these things you can do one of two things you can either design it toward the idea that everyone has the same type of character and a player's ability is going to have to increase in order for them to be able to be good Mm-hmm. Um, or you can design it in such a way that uh, while that will always be a factor, there's still an element of um, sca- you know, scaling in there, scaffolding, if you will. Um, that the, the RPG elements mean that your character actually does level up, have better, better gear, better weapons, better whatever it is. Um, but if you do it right, it's also going to mean that every time you get new gear, you're going to have to learn how to use it. And that's one of the problems that I have with Battlefront, is that a lot of the gear just seems very, very samey, or even useless. And until you buy it, you have no way to know that. And buy it with the in-game currency, I mean. So you can spend three or 4,000 credits on a gun and then be like, oh, nope, that was awful, and never use it again. So I, I think that the, the problem that I really had with Battlefront comes down to I played for three or four or five or six hours, um... It got kind of samey. I was waiting for, for more. It didn't come. I realized 100 hours was going to have to be invested in to get my character uh, to a place where I could own and trash and, and be awesome to the noobs. Um, and I realized I just didn't really want to dedicate that to it. So, yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah. Uh, I guess the game I've been playing the most recently would be uh, Witcher 3. Um, I talked a little bit about it before our technical difficulties, but... Um, Essentially, it's a uh, the things I like about it. Real quick, I'm not going to try to recreate anything I said before, but um, it has this because it was based on a uh, series of Norwegian no- novels, and it is being made by uh, CD Projekt Red, which I believe is based in Norway, or if not, they're based over in that region of the world. Yeah, they're a really cool company, um, and they're really neat. Um, I love when I got it. Uh, one of the first things that that they had was um, packaged with the game. There was a thank you letter for buying the game, uh-huh. and um, it, and I mentioned this when I first bought it. Um, and then also it had a, like, here's some download codes for, like, some free, a bunch of free DLC. See, and that's like impressive. That. Um, that's even DLC yeah. done right. Yeah. 
So they're really cool, and um, when they do have, and I haven't played any of the expansions come out far enough in the game. Yeah. But uh, they have an expansions. Like it's it's presented as like here's additional quests and content and stuff. It's not just mm-hmm. buy a hat. Kind yeah, of we, nonsense. we we took a big bite out of this game because we didn't finish it, and yeah. so um, we're going to send an apology letter. <laughs> yeah, this this is a huge this is a huge game actually, and the, the new content from what I've seen is actually just additional like mini stories. So it's like this is a completed game, really. It's not like the we've it's not like DLC gets a bad rap because a lot of a lot of DLC is just we've already made this content. It's actually part of the game, but we're not going to give it to you. You have to pay money to unlock it. That's not what this is. So anyway, so what I like about uh, Witcher 3, it's an open-world um, RPG, which are kind of all the rage right now. They're hugely... Um, they're in vogue. I mean, open-world games in general are in vogue. Like, one of my favorite games I've mentioned many times, you know, Grand Theft Auto V mm-hmm. came out recently. Fallout. Uh, about a couple Four. years ago. But yes, but the more recent examples in terms of open-world RPGs, like you were saying, Fallout 4, um, Skyrim, um, those are both uh, Bethesda. Yeah. But uh, but what I like about um, Witcher 3 and where it kind of stands stands alone is... Well, for starters, you could you could argue that there is a little bit more of an RPG. Uh, that's probably the wrong way to say. It it has more ties to the PC RPGs of the day than say a Fallout Four or a Skyrim. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got the whole like uh, managing your equipment. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You need to repair your equipment, like degrading or whatever it's called. I forget. Uh, but yeah, so the the you know you have uh, your your equipment degrades over time, things like that as you use it. Um, you have you can carry a certain amount of items and stuff like and and uh, you enhance your equipment. There's like crafting that kind of thing. So it's like almost has this kind of a mixture of old PC RPGs like a Baldur's Gate mixed with like an open world game um, because it does have um, different ways that you approach dialogue. Although it's not a it's less of a dialogue system because there's like very there's very few choices. It's, it's less about the dialogue system and more about how do you approach it. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Knights of the Republic. If you remember in Knights of the Republic, you could use your your Jedi abilities, your Force abilities, to influence people. Yeah, sure. Or to intimidate them or stuff like that. And um, as a Witcher, you have some abilities that are comparable. So you can use delusions to make people think that um, what you're saying is the truth, or to make them think that they want to they want to help you, or something like that. Or you can use you have to level up these abilities, of course. Mm-hmm. Or you can intimidate them, or you could force them to back off, and you can like you can put them in a daze, you know, stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. So where do you get these abilities from? Is it from killing the monsters? No, you because you are a witcher, you already have some of these abilities innately. It's just that you have you have a low level version of them starting out. You have um five or six signs, I forget. But um you as you level up those signs, you can use them in new ways. So like for example, one of the signs that you get is um I want to say it's the one called Agni. They all have these weird Norwegian names. And, uh, and they look like little runes, runic symbols. Oh, it's stuff. like going to Ikea. Yeah, <laughs> there nice. you go. Um, but yeah, so it's it's this one where you can you can sort of um, daze an enemy. And as you level it up, you can like mind control the enemy and force it to fight alongside you and stuff like really? that. But in conversations, the way that it, it impacts itself is you can you can fool people into doing what you want. You can, use to, you can cast delusions on them to make them think other things mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So it's little things like that that you, that they have applications both in... Um, interactions with um, humans, and mm-hmm. then also in combat, and everything kind of mixes up like that. So it's really interesting. interesting the way it's set up. Is there a karma system? I mean, are you playing a, a not really overtly well, good and or evil character? Your your character is a witcher, and you could say that they're good in a way, but they're also they have their own set of morals. So oh. it's like as a witcher, for example, you are supposed to, and of course you do have a choice; you don't have to do that. But you are supposed to honor contracts, for example. Like, mm-hmm. if, so, if you say you're going to do something, you do it, regardless of what happens. Hmm. But you only have to follow what you agreed to. And let me give you an example. Like so, a letter of the law type stuff? Or? Yes. So, for example, there's this one quest that I did recently where I found this, like, priest who, who was worried about these, um, you know, a bunch of people had been killed or something like that in these, that were delivering something to the city. Um, I can't remember the specific details. Mm-hmm. And he wanted me to go and burn the remains to sort of like consecrate the area or something. So I go to the first place. I find the dead bodies. Like he said, I find the merchant caravan. So it's his story seems to check out. And of course, I'd already agreed to this. So I slay the monsters and I 
consecrate the, the bodies. So I do it to the second one. When I go to the third, there's a person there. A, one of the merchants is still alive, and he's battling ghouls. So I save him from the ghouls, and then he explains to me that uh, basically this priest had you know sent his people over there to um, to kill the merchants, and he he was basically using me to destroy the evidence. Oh, it was it was all it was all a ruse. But here, but and so he and I have a choice right now. Now my choice is I can kill this guy uh-huh. because in a way, depending on how I interpret the contract, I could have interpreted it as oh. I get it. That's what he wanted me to do. Okay, well, he's one of these that I'm supposed to be consecrated. He's one of the bodies I'm supposed to be mm-hmm. consecrated. I could kill him if I wanted to. <laughs> but but really, the contract was you know, to destroy the dead bodies, not to kill anyone living. He didn't say that. So mm-hmm. I chose not to. So I said, all right, you're free to go, but I still consecrated the last set of bodies. So I still ended up destroying the... Because that was my contract. Yeah. I didn't have to, but I chose to. Because now if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have completed the quest. So I could have chosen not to burn those bodies too. Wouldn't have completed the, the quest though. So and I you did would have it. been denied the XP or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So I did it, and then I went back to him to collect my reward. Mm-hmm. Now I could have told him. Didn't have to tell him about the, about the person's body there. Mm-hmm. But I also like to play Geralt as a badass mm-hmm. because he pretty much is. So I just I told him I said yeah. There's also a, a person that was living there. Oh, and I didn't kill him because he didn't tell me I had to, I was supposed to kill anybody living. And mm-hmm. I called him out and explained. I know I know exactly what you did. And then he's held, he's, he comes back and says, well, you shouldn't tell any, don't tell anyone about this, blah, 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 I'll give you extra money or something like that. Um, I picked, you know, to basically tell him, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll say whatever I want. And uh, he decided to attack me, which was, of course, a very bad idea. That's always a bad idea. Of course idea. he had guards. And of course he had like some weird, he was like a sorcerer or some BS. So he had some magical abilities. But um, I slaughtered them and then I just, you know took what was on their bodies. So I got, I got my cash anyway, mm-hmm. and that was the end of the quest. But I could have approached that quest in different ways. Um, but yeah, I'd say I, I, some people have named it. I think, I know IGN gave gave Witcher 3 their game of the year. I wouldn't go that far, at least not yet. But um, I've really enjoyed it. So I'm enjoying nice. it so far, and uh, yeah. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. Let's briefly do some Table Talk then. Oh, fantastic. And we've, we've played some games uh, recently as well. We have. We have. Um, well, you know, I, I, I usually get a stack for Christmas. We we live locally near a store that does a buy two, get one free sale mm. at the end of December. And my birthday um, actually is, is today at the yeah. time of recording, which is <laughs> exactly. kind of funny. But uh, <laughs> I usually get my birthday presents from uh, family a couple weeks early mm. because uh, we buy them in December. And, and so I get to pick them out and go through the store and that sort of thing. And so I end up with January being this time when I have all these new games to play. So I'm very excited because I'm, I'm sure we're going to be doing lots of table talk in the next few episodes. Mm-hmm. But um, the one I want to talk about today is called um, Colt Express. Mm-hmm. And what this is named for is the idea of a gun, you know, the Colt 45. Oh. <clears throat> it's a cowboy game, but really it's a train robber game, and you play as a bandit. That sounds pretty interesting. What's mm-hmm. Yeah, what's most amazing is it's a programming game. Um, so you wouldn't think of that as, as being a normal thing for, for cowboys, but really the programming aspect is very similar to Robo Rally, if you know that classic. In Robo Rally, you, you program your registers, you um, all reveal at the same time, and then the robots push each other and it messes you up, and you go, oh no, I didn't mean to do that thing, and I fell in a hole, and uh, I shot the other robot, and that sort of thing. Um, well, in this one, you're moving your bandits around and reacting to each other kind of um, it's turn-based, but but in real time as as well. Hmm. So I've seen that you've moved, but I don't know which direction you're going to move because you can move either way from from a train car. So I'm I'm going to predict that you're going to come in, and so I'll move up to the roof, um, and and then you um, continue moving on in the next turn, and then you shoot and and you you loot and that kind of a thing. And so after five big rounds, what happens is the person with the most loot wins. Um, if you punch somebody, they drop their loot. You have to pick it up. Um, there's a marshal moving through the train. He's trying to help you. But the coolest thing about this thing is they could have very, very easily done, you know, just a, a 2D train picture um, on a board and you could be moving around, but they didn't. They did a 3D fully assemblable train. Hmm. And it's got all these different cars, like six different cars. Um, there's an expansion with a stagecoach, which I also picked up. And uh, the little meeples uh, have guns, and it is just amazing. And the art is fantastic. And the characters have mm. individual abilities. And 
I love it. I just absolutely think it's fantastic. That sounds really cool. I, I actually want to play that. Yeah. It sounds um, really so cool. So on our next game night, on our next backward compatible game yeah. night, uh, <laughs> we'll play it. But um, how, how how big, if I can ask, I mean, cause you, you're saying they have little train cars and all yeah. that. Does it take up a lot of space? Well, it, it takes up a lot of, call it linear space. Because okay. um, it's a train, it's on a line. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when you when you get the whole thing out there and you get six players, which is it's, it's between two and six players, hmm. uh, and it scales really well because you put as many trains cars on the train as you have players. Oh, okay. okay so it yeah, scales it really. Sense. When you have all the trains connected up and the stagecoach and everything else, um, it's about about two feet, two feet long, hmm. uh, give or take. So um, I, I think it's fantastic and a lot of fun, and you can play in about forty minutes, which is even better. And is the setup not as long? No, that's the brilliant <laughs> thing, actually. Um, the, the, the train cars fit right back in the box with no disassembly. Oh, nice. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so it, it genius. Cool. It's absolute cool. genius. That sounds really cool. And so we'll, can you repeat the name of the game? Colt Express? Colt Express. And who made the game? Yeah, so it's actually a French game, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the designer... His name is uh, Christophe Rembault. I'm sure I'm saying his name in a very American way. Mm. Um, but it, the company is called Ludonaut, which I have not heard of before. Um, spelled in the uh, sort of French way, which would be L-U-D-O-N-A-U-T-E. Ludo being game, I would assume. Mm. And not being um, explorer of. I'm making this up. I have no idea. Um, but it's also um, apparently uh, with Asmodee, which is a, a, another publisher. Uh, they're probably like the distributor or something. Um, but I thought it was kind of interesting because actually on the side of the, the box, like, you know, on the insert, whenever you pull mm-hmm. it up, it actually has like actual pictures of the guys, um, who made it. So like, Oh, the, that's the, cool. Yeah. And including the artist and, and various other things. And so. they're wearing berets and they have like a table with one uh, cheese we, we, on it. Yeah, yeah. It. No. no, it's just their headshots. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, one, one final, um, and most important thing is that there's a character, as I mentioned, they all have special abilities, but there's a character who gets to have seven cards instead of six. And mm-hmm. his name is Doc. Um, and he bears a slight resemblance to myself. Um, and so I call dibs from here into perpetuity, um, being able to use Doc, which is the blue character. <laughs> and that's important. So okay. It's now been documented. It has. I see what you did there. I see yeah. what you did there. It's time for War Stories. Tales of tribulation and triumph in gaming. So we want to do kind of a, a quick look back on 2015 hmm. and um, kind of tell us your highs and your lows. Okay. Yeah, Ga- are know. we talking gaming-wise? Oh, well, yeah. Um, you know, and, and this could be a, a war story, if you like, um, or it could be more like, um, wow, I really hated that one game. I wish I hadn't uh, spent money on it. I know for me, uh, it was whenever I talked about that... Rather disappointing back and forth struggle that I had with um, with Broken Age. Oh, remember yeah. my remember my three episode saga with I hate it, I love it, I hate it. Yeah, yeah. I tried to play some of it and I didn't like it. At I know all, the so. opener it just it it was insulting, it was degrading, so on and so forth. Um, and so I'd like to begin by saying I'm very excited about the idea that Psychonauts is going to have a sequel. Um, was just announced, and mm. I'm really hoping that is, that is this time for talk about distrust of this new like, well, and and that's the Kickstarter esque. Th- that's the thing. That's what I'm. Well, we <laughs> talked about Fig, and and yeah. actually, I think we even called it um, this year because whenever yeah. we first talked about Fig, and we saw that Schaefer was was on board with it, and one of the um, the curators, shall yeah. we say, um, it does not surprise me a bit that oh look, he's he's drawing attention no. to it with. With this. No, it doesn't at all. It, what what scares me with that is the there's things in its um, the description of of the pro, of the the way Fig is set up, like mm-hmm. the user policies or whatever, um, or user agreement when you give money. I guess that yep. they don't have to spend the money you give on the game. No, they don't. And this is a problem because if you look at his recent history with with Kickstarter, you know, crowdfunding projects. Yes, he hasn't exactly been um, very. What's the word I'm looking for? Efficient with his money? Well, um, but who has? Effective? Well, I mean, but those people are not running their own, like, you know, crowd sor- crowdfunding projects where they're taking money for, for a particular project, and it actually says in their user agreement, we can use this money for whatever the heck, whatever the heck we want to. Yeah, that's true. That's where it gets kind of, like, And they're, not, and they're not Tim Schafer. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so, so do you think do you think that it's low hanging fruit to do what to say oh look Psychonauts too. Um. I th- you, th- you think I th- it's a, money, th- a genuine I think, money grab? I think so. I want to say fig trees, lo- fruit lo- hangs pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's a bad joke. I see um, what you did there. Yeah. yeah um, I it, for me, and I, I, I played I played Psychonauts um, on your recommendation back in in college, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed the game, but I enjoyed the game more for a lot of the potential that I saw in it. Mm-hmm. It it was it was a f- both enjoyable and interesting game and also deeply flawed game i would agree with that um in terms of a lot of the way the gameplay was set up there were a lot of like experimental ideas yes, and, there were. and some of them worked and some of them really didn't work yeah and so it was just kind of this weird mixed bag and so when i hear oh yeah we're gonna do psychonauts too so my immediate thought is so are you gonna just are you gonna take what worked and do that again or are you gonna try to be experimental and there's there's negatives in both of that, you know, because people have a certain expectation. Because when you have a game that it's it's sort of gained this kind of like notoriety and, and infamy, infamy. Would yeah, be, yes. you're right. And um, but people that really like it, they're remembering all the good parts. That well, that's really right. Like. It's of got course. the nostalgia glasses firmly and, entrenched. And and there's and, and that happens with with plenty of games. Sure. The only difference is with this particular game, it really did have a lot of moments that were great and a lot of moments that were pretty bad. So it has mm-hmm. this huge mixed bag, and if you're only looking at the good parts, it's going to be very easy to get disappointed with a sequel. Yeah. Very easy, because now you're suddenly forced to replay it, and, and essentially not replay it, but play a game similar, and if they're going for the same style that they did with the first one, mm-hmm. you're going to find the same sort of problems, and it, it has a, the potential to be a very disappointing game. That's assuming he actually releases a completed game, which I will go on record right now, reckless speculation, and say he will not. It will be another project that is going to come out half complete. I will go on the record okay. and say that now. Um, I'm not Wait, saying. Now, that, now, did you think that Broken Age was half complete? Where, where are you getting um, that from? What was that other the other game that he that he did recently that he came out with? Oh, that one. I the, forgot the name of it. The the, the, the adventure game. Um, the, are you talking about the Kickstarter adventure game that he did? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember the name, but that was the one that came out that was not complete, and that like he just kind of like. Oops! Ran out of money and like threw it out to people and to like finish it. It was yeah. very it was very unprofessional. No, yeah. Broken Age. I would say was complete. I just didn't like it. This, gotcha. the one okay. I'm talking about, is like I don't, I don't remember the name of it. But we're, we're thinking of the same one though. The yeah, one that came I think out. There's so. it kind of a big stink about the, the. It was not handled professionally, and so I'm, I'm worried that it's going to be something similar here, especially because. This is a like even sites like he's Schaefer's already been a like I'm going to dream big type of designer, and now he's going to do that with a game that is at least has the reputation of being experimental. You put those two together, and it's risky. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah. But we'll see. I mean, I, I can't see the future. I'm just speculating. Um, but it's an interesting It's an interesting that, that he's going to try. So I was I was both disappointed and then in the end finally satisfied um, whenever I played Broken Age. Part of it for me, uh, there was two factors. Yeah. Um, the first was I actually traded in a stack of games to to get the money and then spent about half of it on Broken Age mm. and I felt like it was overpriced. That was my, my my first thing. Is situationally for me, I felt like I got ripped off. Second thing was though that a couple of months after I played it, it actually was one of the free to play ones on um, PlayStation Plus. Oh. And I tell you, I could I could just make predictions what the next free couple of games are going to be on PlayStation Plus just because they're the ones I've recently purchased. <laughs> and that's the way it always seems to end up with me is that um, you know, I buy a game and a couple of months later, oh look, there it is. and I sh- I've gotten where I don't even want to buy digital content anymore because I'm like all I have to do is wait and it'll it'll become unlocked. Same thing happened with with just a long list of games. Mm. Anyway, that's that's my um, that's my war story for 2015. What's yours? Um, well, let's see. I've I've had um, hmm, that's a good question. I guess for me, um, this year I, I or in 2015, I should say, I did buy uh, two new consoles. So that is something I got um, a PS4 and a Wii U, and uh, very different experiences. Oh yeah, but. Um, allowed me to play some games that I may not have or I would not have been able to play otherwise. Um, so I think that's something that for me was pretty interesting. I mean, of course, this was the year that or last year was the year that I um, was able to find a full-playing job and I think something that is 
I don't know about a war story, but it's something from 2015 that stands out to me is that I don't have as much time for gaming. And so I kind of approach games in a different way. Um, and part of that is because even when I have time for games, I don't necessarily want to take the time to play them. Uh, if I if I, I spend mo- a lot of my day, um, you know, looking at computer screens anyway. So <laughs> yeah. when I come home, a couple of things happened. One, I found that I don't want to sit at my PC. My PC. I don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. So I've pretty much completely stopped playing PC games. And I, I've loved, I have a long history of, of loving PC games. And I basically stopped playing them. You know, since since I started working uh, back in around April, shortly thereafter, I, I quit playing PC games altogether, and because um, I didn't, want, I wanted to to get on a couch. I didn't want, I did not want to sit at a desk. You know, I had a very similar experience yeah. actually. That's one of the reasons why I haven't played uh, Minecraft in a long time. Mm. But yeah, that's that's why I ended up getting uh, those consoles too. Is I was like, well, you know, I want to play games, but I just I I want to sit on my couch and do it. So um, I got a PS4 and I played some 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 games that I really enjoyed, like one I talked about recently, Witcher Three, obviously Metal Gear Solid Five, and, and games like that. And uh, yeah, and I got a Wii U because I was interested in a lot of the Nintendo. I, I'm a huge Nintendo fan, and it allowed me to play some cool Nintendo games, uh, which I might talk more about those a little bit later. But um, uh, games like Super Mario 3D Land or uh, Mario Maker, some interesting and um, Different ideas usually coming out of Nintendo, which I which I like. I think it's good to have variety in gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's definitely variety when you get a Nintendo system, at least variety from other um, consoles that are out. So yeah, I guess I guess really that would be my highlight. You could say the biggest change for me in um, 2015 was um, I guess I'm no longer part of the PC gaming master race. <laughs> you know, I am, I'm not either. I mean, I, 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 of course, I have nothing against people that play on PC, and I actually kind of envy them that they are able to do that still. Yeah. But for me, and I, and I've tried to, I've tried to go back, and there's a few games. Sometimes I'll play a little bit on PC. I know I talked a little bit about Pillars of Eternity. I was able to play some of that. But um, by and large, you know, just like generally speaking, I mean, when I look to buy a game, I'm not looking at what am I going to buy for PC. And you're not looking on Steam. And I'm not looking on Steam. Yeah. So it's a different different experience for me. So. Gotcha. Well, I, I think the that double fun game that you were referring to is uh, Space Base DF Nine. Yes, that's that's the it. One. Yeah, that's it. So it came to me magically through yes. the web. There we go. But, don't cut. Don't cut this, Chris. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> Well, it is time for our meaty topic, um, which is going to be talking about our game of the year oh, cool, choices cool. this year. Um, can, can we can we make uh, some strange some strange nominations? Game game of the year, a box of triscuits. Have you heard of the Golden Globe reference where uh, The Martian won um, the uh, the best film for musical and comedy, even though it is neither a musical nor or a comedy. comedy. Yeah. So my game of the year. Box of Triscuits. Are you are you serious? No, is this actually. Oh, oh, did, oh, did that happen with that, the Martian? That yes. With the Mar- yes, really? That's oh. why I made the yeah. How, how does how? that happen? Um, because the Golden Globes has lost their mind. I guess I don't know, oh. but yes, it, it, is it just fixed? Maybe it's just fixed. Well, my theory is that um, they basically are using the musical and comedy category as a like B best movie award. Like you're you you can't win the best movie, so we're going to give you like the B version of the award. The musical and comedy only version, oh. kind of like I, it's like consolation prize kind of yeah. thing. Was my guess. The so, Revenant one for best movie. I still haven't seen. It. I that really actually makes it. some sense. It's like um, it, the movie itself wasn't a comedy, but we're being funny by by having this fake category. <laughs> well, the, I looked at the other other nominees, and a lot of them were legitimate. That being said, there were some horrible choices huh. in that musical comedy category. So take that for what you will. Interesting. Yeah, and that inc- that concludes our segment on other stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there moving, we go. Yes, moving on moving to on. our meeting topic. <laughs> yeah, let's actually do a meet. Let's actually do our meeting topic now. Uh, so, so what is your game of the year and why? Um, okay, so uh, my game of the year is uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, I and, never would have guessed. Yeah, I've talked it up a lot, and um, I think a big part of that, of course, has to do with it being the last game in the Metal Gear saga, uh, as far as we Ostensibly, know. Ostensibly, but yeah, yeah, essentially. Well, yes, it's not. Speaking just, of unfinished games. 
Yeah, it in it it did sort of it is sort of supposedly missing that extra um chapter which yeah, the last chapter, yeah. That being said, there really there is an ending that makes sense in the game. It's not mm-hmm. like there's just an abrupt stop. Well, there can't ever be an ending for Snake. Not really. Yeah. I mean, he, the, he's one of those stock characters, you know, he he's like I whenever I get on my pun intended snake skin, mm-hmm. <laughs> see what I did there? Mm. Um, I want to be Snake. Now, now I'm speaking hypothetically because I'm not a huge fan of the series, yeah. but uh, well, you know, if if I want to be if I want to be Link, right? Mm-hmm. I'm going to go play Legend of Zelda, and I'm going to be Link, which coincidentally is a game I'm really looking forward to for uh, the first time in a long time. It's 2016, the new Zelda game. Good. I've not played a Zelda in a long time, but the new one looks amazing. You, it's open you world. still need to go play Link, Link uh, Between Worlds. Uh, yeah, you're right, I do. But um, that said, you know... That, did, that came out two years ago, didn't it? There, 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 there can't ever be a conclusion to these stories, because, because they're epics. Yes, um, and and the thing the thing that I, the thing with Metal Gear Solid Five, of course, there's we just say snake generally, but there's like multiple snakes technically. Yeah. And uh, in Metal Gear Solid Five, it had this really great story about the um, essentially, and of course now we're, we can have spoilers because it's been a while, mm-hmm. but like a doppelganger of Snake is who you of, of Big Boss specifically of Naked Snake, Big right. Boss, um, which is of course the becomes the villain of the Metal Gear series later on, the bad the the villain of. Solid Snake, which mm-hmm. is who we normally refer to when we say Snake, and also his um, biological father from through cloning that kind of thing. Right. Um, but um, so essentially, the so as you you are essentially you think that you're playing as Big Boss the whole time, but really you're playing as his doppelganger. And the interesting part about it is he is essentially Snake because his memories have been reprogrammed. He is he is Big Boss up to the accident when he goes into his coma, and then at that point. He splits off and becomes his own person, right. and he goes through a very different course of development to the point where, um, by the end of the game, you sort of come to view—at least I did—Big Boss as more of a Big Boss almost does come across as more of a villain after this. Hmm. Whereas, um, the Big Boss that you're playing, the doppelganger, he almost is more of a noble figure, even though he does a lot of things that are. You could argue villainous, mm-hmm. but he has this no, this like nobility to him, which is interesting. This very like the way that he tr- interacts with his soldiers, the way like the loyalty that he has for them, and the way that like despite all the bad things that he does, um, the game is 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 very, it does a really good job of giving him this imbuing him with this nobility. But uh, just a lot of a lot of touching moments. Uh, Kojima's great at like movie moments and that kind yeah, of thing, sure. cinematic. So, uh, but for that reason, because it. Closes the series. Also because I loved the... Um, the soundtrack is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, the um, gameplay is the best in the series easily. It actually finally gives you um, an excellent sense of like this tactical uh, combat that it's been trying to do since the first game. And could sort of do it, but it always had flaws and it sort of worked, but kind of didn't. And That's the way I always felt about and it. And now it works perfectly. It's brilliant it's fantastic it has an i i would say if i'm going to give an award just for pure what game has the best gameplay i would say Metal Gear solid five wow so it's it's that sort of like it's it's really that good and I, there's some there's some close runners there like runners up but mm-hmm. i i don't know i mean i could i guess i could technically say mario maker but i think it's a cheat because it's using mario mechanics from like you know yeah, decades yeah. ago so it's kind of a cheat to say that um but uh but yeah so yeah so, um it is for those reasons, I mean, just like the, co- the the taking gameplay and story and this emotional connection that I've had with the series for so long and put all those together in a neat package. And for me, it's just gave me the best feeling. It's my game of the year. I'm going to go easily with uh, Fallout 4 on this one hmm. for my game of the year because um, there are four main reasons. And the first is the RPG elements of Fallout are, are my favorite um, just looking at the series globally, uh, the special system I think is one of the most elegant and perfect for video games, and I will preface that specifically for video games. So often we, we shoehorn in all these tabletop elements that are n- unnecessary, mm-hmm. but I think that special really has it down to let's call it the minimum of what matters in a video game. That's going to have dialogue interaction. It's going to have shooting. It's going to have carry weight. It's going to have these other things. Um, and I think the special system is, um, and always has been, well-designed. It's still there. So because it's there, it's a special game, and I like it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, 
of the world. Uh, I haven't always felt like all the Fallout games um, captured the world as perfectly as the others, um, but this one, the the Commonwealth or the Boston Commonwealth, if you will, um, is um, wonderful. Now, there's mm-hmm. always this added little bonus whenever a video game takes place in a place that I've actually been, well, and I've been to Boston. Was there mm-hmm. for the Argfesto Con of 2008. And had a chance to walk the Freedom Trail and, and other things like that. And so doing that in-game was was fun. It, you know, it, it really was interesting. It's the same reason why I love the Assassin's Creeds that take place in Italy and, and England and France and Spain and that sort of thing. Um, but the uh, the world was, was very clearly a Fallout world. And this time I think the art nailed it. I think that they, they stayed away from the, the brown and green color palette except... Um, in moments, let's call, them, call them dark, scary moments, where you turn on your Pip Boy light, and then suddenly you're back immersed in that green, uh, lit, dark place again. And so, being able to move from that into the beautiful blue sky that's in Fallout Four, and um, the the world, the the overworld that just feels like Fallout without being dreary and depressing all the time, all mm. the time. I think they nailed it. So it really feels like a Fallout world to me. And, and that's the second reason why I like the game. Third reason why I like the game is I think that the main quest, the character story, was done well this time. I really did not get into the main story quest for um, New Vegas. It's, oh, you start out, you're a courier, and, and you've, uh, you've been knocked out or lost your memory or whatever it was. I just never cared. I absolutely never cared. Um, the idea of being a vault dweller is so very much wrapped up in being the main character of Fallout. And yet this time they did it with uh, an actual... I, I want to think of him as a time traveler because he was in that stasis pod. Um, we actually get to see the world before the you know the event. We actually get to see the bombs go off. It's just amazing to me. You know, we, we, we have a Mr. Handy who's our butler. We have a baby. We have all this. I mean, it's just, wow, this is so... That, that really sucked me in. And I really felt like the the main story was um, a good hook this time. Now, do I think that um, the story was um, compelling enough for me to go find Sean immediately? No, um, and I think Will would probably Will Parsons would probably disagree with me on that one because um, you know he he always um, talks about how he has to follow the main main story and the stuff get stuff on the side. And and you know I I understand that you there's a point in which you have to make decisions and track him down. And there's some genuine um, detectiveness that has to happen. I really mm. like that. I think that's cool. But I got it. I got to a place where I had communities going, I had other things going. I pretty much figured out that he was a lot older than he was supposed to be. And I thought, you know, as, as a player and as a character, if you will, as a role player, he's going to be okay. And, and I met it a little bit to know he's going to be fine and I'll get around to it eventually. And I focused on the Minutemen, and I focused on the, um, ignoring the Brotherhood, which is a, <laughs> a thing that I like to do, and um, collecting as many power suits as I possibly could. And, and so, uh, but in terms of the story and the hook and all of that, it was way more compelling to me than Skyrim and being a you know the Dragon Lord or whatever the heck you're supposed to Dragonborn. That's it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and some of the other Fusrada. stories. Yeah, um, <laughs> you have a limited amount of time to go get the water chip. That was that was really compelling. You know, that kind of a thing uh, in the first follow-up. Right. Uh, and I don't think that that's been duplicated. But I think this is a close second. Uh, and finally, my fourth point, the reason why I would give it Game of the Year, is um, the actually the building, um, modding, and the junk... Uh, customization. Customization that has been put into this one. I think we're going to see that in every fallout from now on. It's completely optional. And I like that. There's a few moments where the, uh, they say, please go to this place and, and set up a little radio in a community. And if you do that once, you can um, forget about it from that point on. But, you know, if you choose to build your community, you can build your community. If you choose not to build your community, you can just ignore that. And you could be a, a lone wanderer who does that and you haven't brought the Commonwealth together. And, and that's just the way you chose to roll. Um, both work. And so I've gone the route of building a huge community centered out of the, um, you know, the first place, your, your hometown, basically, mm-hmm. where, where your house was, um, which is, uh, what's it called? It's, I want to say Haven, but that's not right. It's uh, it's called uh, Sanctuary. 
<laughs> I've been I've been focusing on um, basically on building community mm. out of uh, out of sanctuary, which is the first place that you come out of. It's where your house was uh, before you ended up in the pod and all of that. And there's um, you can set up supply lines, and there's a few things that and I, then I'll talk slightly negatively about. Mm. Um, like like for example, uh, you get a perk, and then um, you can build supply lines, but it doesn't tell you or show you how to build supply lines. Um, and you actually have to assign an individual person who is in your community, assuming you've built a community, to go to another one of your communities. And that person will then get themselves a Brahmin and will begin walking the wasteland back and forth between those two spots. And you instantly have all the stuff that you've stored in those communities. Hmm. Um, and if you don't set those supply lines up, you won't have your stuff. Now, do they actually walk? They physically okay. walk. So you could. So do they get... Could they get killed along the way? I have never seen that happen, um, but I think it is. Um, I think it's possible. So there, these these uh, your communities these, can be attacked. these supply runners are base are pretty much better than the player for the most part. Well, that's <laughs> that's always been true of the merchants, <laughs> yeah. hasn't it? Though the merchants, yeah, the merchants, this, you just have a game where you just play as a merchant because they're just the most badass. Yeah, yeah, no, I could totally see that. <laughs> um, and then it would be escort missions and nothing else, <laughs> which everyone loves, right? Yeah, of course. Um, so let's let's start designing that MMO called Escort. Hmm. Um, I think it'll be a hit. It'll be great. Um, and all the NPCs are the heroes. There you go, running around. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's my short list. Um, I, I really think that. The way that they've done the the weapons mm. in in Fallout Four is really well done. It feels like weapons that have been created in the post apocalypse. Uh, it's never quite been adequately explained to me why it is that it's two hundred years after the blast, but you can still go find a shopping cart with bullets in it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there's. I mean, I haven't played this one, but in in the Fallout series, and definitely more so in the Bethesda Fallout games, mm-hmm. there's a, too much abundance of things like that. I think there's a conceit. Um, that you must sort of acknowledge, which is no one has been here to this spot except you, um, except for the the raiders who went to their spot and that sort of a thing. And that maybe this whole area, call it the Boston Commonwealth or whatever your example is, maybe this whole area has just recently been resettled. The population boom has just, for whatever reason, recently happened. And so, again, it's kind of a conceit, but you've got you to think about the, the idea that uh, you're the first one here in a couple hundred years. Mm. And so that body that you're seeing that's been laying there, you're the first one to lay eyes on it, that kind of a thing. Um, and there's some fun parallels in the beginning of the game, too, um, with that. Like, you, you you walk past these people who are screaming, let me in, let me in, and the next time you pass, it's it's the future, the bombs have fallen, and you see dead bodies in that same spot. And you know those are the same people. Um, so that, that's kind of fun stuff. Um, they, Wait, but... When you say dead body, you do mean like skeletons. Yeah, yeah, the dead skeleton oh, okay, okay. in the in the Fallout way, you okay. know, and of the everything weirdly got preserved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's a conceit there too. You know, when you go find your fr- frosted sugar bombs or whatever that's in a refrigerator, there there was so many preservatives in there that they're it's still edible, mm-hmm. highly irradiated, but still still edible, right? Um, now, see that I believe. Yeah, <laughs> that I actually believe. With some of the way that the preserv- preservatives are set up, and, uh, and some of these, I can believe. You know, if you find, like, say, like a Twinkie or a yeah. or a frosted fruit puffs or whatever, you find something like that after hundreds and hundreds of years, it's probably going to be okay. Probably still edible. See, yeah. Yeah, this, not this is... maybe not the best thing that you should be eating. Mm-hmm. It might make you a little sick, mm-hmm. but uh, it's edible. Yeah, uh, I can believe but that. But there, there are some really fun um, small missions. Like um, I won't get too into it because it's a, a big spoiler. But um, there, there's one house that you walk into. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a mansion and uh, a row house, of course. Perfectly preserved. Absolutely perfectly preserved. And the way that the guy is talking, you can tell he's a scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, he seems to be talking as if um, he also is from before the war. Mm-hmm. And, and there's some things that... And it's not on the main story at all. Uh, but, but there's some things in this game that I think delve deeper into the hows and the whys of the Fallout world and the Fallout universe um, that we've not quite seen before. I, I think everybody pretty much knows that the vaults were a, a, a massive social experiment. Yeah, um, Every vault had a completely I... different set of variables and that the scientists were expecting to be able to just collect the data and... I think, yeah, I think for me with, and probably the reason why I've not like, because I'm a huge Fallout fan, but the reason why I probably haven't just yeah, leapt are. at playing this game is that 
I knew from the start, even when they at first announced it, that that was where they were going with it. Like, we're going to try to explain some of these the background stuff. And for mm-hmm. me, I never wanted that explanation. Yeah, the mystery. I, well, I love the mystery. I love trying to pe- like trying to think. Okay, what could it have been for myself? And right. it takes away. From just from my perspective, it takes something away from me, and so it's like almost like I'm afraid to eat because it doesn't matter what it could be the most brilliant explanation in, mm-hmm. ever imagined, and I'm sure I'm sure it falls somewhere in between, but it could even be the most brilliant, but it would never measure up to like you, you're still going to lose that that air of mystery. Alien is better than aliens because you couldn't see the alien. Yeah. Oh. God. Yeah. We can go into a whole yeah. thing about why no, aliens I'm, I'm is a better you. movie. But, I'm with you. But yeah. But anyways. But that's just that's the thing on me, and I know some people just don't care, and they just want to play. You know, they're they're more interested in the gameplay and less in, um, less in some less in some of that those like world building elements and some of those mysteries that mm-hmm. I that I personally enjoy. It's just different people. Yeah. But I'll, I'm sure I'll get around to playing it eventually. Though yeah. it's just and, and I don't think time. you'll find anything that's too um, world shatteringly yeah, breaking I'm, for you. And either. I wouldn't expect that yeah. either. It's just one of those where. Um, and, and part of it also is that I'm not, I'm not really a huge Bethesda fan either. That's part of it too. Uh, yeah, I yeah. don't like their style of storytelling. I think mostly it comes across as a bit lazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't say it's bad. It's there, there's definitely some elements there that I think are all right. It's just that it comes across as lazy. And well, we need to stick a pin in that one. Stick a pin in that. I, I I agree. We need to talk at some point about how's the right way to tell a story with. Main quests and side quests yeah. where it doesn't feel like main quests and side quests. Yeah. So. Well, I think, yeah, and I think, I, there we go, we'll just, we'll just put a pin in that. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to break there, but um, coming up in a future episode, we're already talking about it, we're going to talk about what we're excited about for 2016. Um, and so... Uh, oh, cool. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of games I'm excited about. Yeah, the, there's this massive list that was just released of, of 100 upcoming games for 2016. It's looking like it's going to be an amazing year for games. I'm really, really stoked. So let's let's end it on one bit of speculation, just a yes or no. We won't go into more detail Reckless yet. speculation. Reckless speculation. Binary edition. Yes. I'm going to ask you right now. Legend of Zelda, will it come out in 2016? No. No? And will it come out for the Wii U? Or the NX? Uh... Or yeah. both. Yeah, both. I'm going to say both, and I'm going to say it comes out early 2017. Yeah, I think well. you're right. Both. I think they're going to hold it back, just like they did Twilight Princess. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, um, I don't even remember how Chris do- did the sign-off, so well, we'll just say we're signing off. This is technically the first <laughs> episode of Season 3, exciting as that is. Uh, so one of the things that we've talked about doing for Season 3 is mm. asking the question, what would you like to hear us talk about oh oh that's because discussion question. makes everyone better um but instead of responding to our thoughts and what we've said challenge us give us a topic give us uh a game to play give us a subject that you want to hear more about uh we will go research it and we will come back and we will have uh either a round table or one of our uh, regular podcast discussions mm-hmm. we'll bring on guests and uh, we will bring that information to you that you wanted to know about. So, and if we get if we get a hundred people to say that that to for, to say that Doc has to play Metal Gear Solid Five, he will play. I will. If there are a hundred people indeed. that say we want Doc to play Metal Gear Solid Five, suffer through the entire game, and then come back with his thoughts. That's right. And wearing if, an eye patch during the whole episode. And if a hundred people it. say that Jim needs to shave his beard, <laughs> oh. He, oh, 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 oh! I, I will. If a hundred people say that, I will. <laughs> you got it, folks. There's All your right. challenge. So. Uh, but yeah, so welcome to 2016. Happy New Year, guys, and thanks for being a macro compatible listener. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Until next time. Bye. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.